Oh, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship. A very special welcome to any who are visiting or who are with us for the first time and an invitation to come for coffee which is served outside the hall at the end of our, at the end of our worship. Church notice is there as printed. Um, you'll see that our study group, our Bible study resumes on Wednesday evening. That's at, that's at 7.30. And next Sunday morning, after the 11 o'clock service, the outreach committee have organized a, a spaghetti lunch as a, as a fundraiser. So that's next, uh, next Sunday. In addition to what's printed there, just to say Life and Work is available and is in the pews. So please take a copy of Life and Work. And finally, my thanks to the members of the, of the worship uh, group, uh, Doug and Cindy, who conducted worship in my absence last, uh, last Sunday, uh, when I, in fact, was worshiping and conducting worship with the Church of Scotland congregation in Rome, uh, which, was, uh, which was very enjoyable indeed. These are all the notices. Let us worship God in singing to his praise, hymn 112, God whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hymn 112. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his, his own people, the flock which he shepherds. Let us pray. Almighty God, the wonders of your creation, the splendor of the heavens, the beauty of the earth, the richness of nature, all speak to us of your glory the coming of your Son, the presence of your Spirit, the fellowship of your church, show us the marvel of your love. And so we gather this day with your whole church in heaven and on earth to offer you our worship and praise, to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all, the God who in love creates and who in love sustains us in our daily work and life. O God of mercy and humbleness of heart, we confess that we have not always lived as we should. <coughs> we can be lacking in the warmth of our love and the commitment of our service to you. We wonder from your ways, ways clearly shown to us in the prophets of old, the saints of the church, and above all, in the life of Christ. And in the continuing prompting of your Holy Spirit, 
who seeks to lead us into the ways of truth and of life. We wander from your ways and can be careless of the very world in which we live, polluting its seas and oceans, poisoning the very air which we breathe, failing to be good stewards of the earth. And while we talk of our concern for others, too often we fail to match our words with action. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O oh, gracious God, grant us the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults and the failings of the past and the guilt that comes with them. Heavenly Father, be with us in every experience of life. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence in our midst and in our lives. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us power to resist. When we are anxious and worried, grant us your peace. And when we are failing in our commitment and in service, renew us and strengthen us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A bit quiet today, but we have some boys and girls with us if they'd like to come down to the, to the front for a bit. Out you come. I was going to start by talking about, uh, about cats this morning. Any of you have pets? What kind of pet do you have? A cat and a fish. Right, and? Right, you have two great Danes. A fish and some chickens, right. But one cat just, we've got one cat. Talk about cats today, but not, not the kind of cat that you have at home. Big cats. Right, but how many big cats can you mention? Not, not the ones that you would keep at home as a pet, but big cats. Lions, right. Jaguars. Jaguars. Tigers. Leopards. Leopards. Cheetahs. Cheetahs. Any more? Mountain lions, yeah, mountain lions. And you get, uh, any more you think of? Black ones. Panthers, lynx. And in Scotland, they've been finding more and more wild cats. Wild cats are just a bit bigger than the kind of cat you have at home, but they're, they're not so friendly. And of the ones I wanted to speak about today, it's the leopard. Right, the leopard. Do you have a favorite? Which is the fastest? The cheetah. the cheetah. And what does the leopard have? What does the leopard look like? Spots. spots. It's got spots. The tiger's got stripes. The leopard's got spots. And there's a saying about leopards. Do you know what it is? Do you know what the saying about leopards is? A leopard never changes its spots, right? A leopard, never, which is, seems a pretty daft thing to say because you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect a leopard to be able to change its spots, would you? That's the way it is. It's always got spots. But what the saying means, what does it mean? People never change how they are. They never change how they are. And if people won't change. If they think someone's never going to change, they sometimes, you know, and someone says to them, oh, so-and-so's changed a bit. He's not what he used to be like, or she's not what he used to be like. You will get people who say, no, 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 a leopard never changes its spots. And that's what they mean. People don't change. Is that true, do you think? Do people change? They do sometimes change. They do sometimes change. And in our church service today, we're going to be talking about a man who did change, and his name was Saul. And one of the things he changed was his name, because he changed his name from Saul 
to Paul. And he became a very, very important person at the beginning of the church, in the very early years of the church, almost 2,000 years ago. And the strange thing about Paul was that when he started out, he didn't like the church at all. And he didn't like what was happening. And he used to have people who were members of the church imprisoned. He had them put before the councils and put in trial. And then he had them imprisoned. And he was really very, very nasty to them. And one day he'd asked that he could be go to a town called Damascus, which is a sad, sad town today because it's in Syria. But he asked to go to a town called Damascus to try and round up all the church members there and take them back to Jerusalem to face trial and be put in prison. And on the way, a strange thing happened to him. And he changed. And there was another man who was one of the church leaders in Damascus. And he was told, go and visit Saul. And he said, I don't think that's a good idea. Because this is a man who's really nasty to the church. And the last person I want to go and see is this man, Saul. He said, no, no, go and see him. Because God said to this person, Ananias, he was called, this is the man, Saul, that I'm going to use for very important work in the church. And Ananias again said, no, 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 I think you've got this wrong. This is not a good idea. And we would not have been surprised if Ananias had said to God, a leopard never changes its spots. Right? But he didn't. He went. And he found that this man, Saul, had changed. And instead of putting people from church in prison and getting them in a whole lot of trouble, he became an important leader in the church. And the church was an awful lot to him all these years later. So it just shows us that people can really change and change quite a lot for the better. For the better. Something happened to Paul on that road and he just changed his whole idea about things. And instead of seeing the church as his enemy, he saw the church as his friends. A leopard never changes its spots. Well, but people, maybe a leopard can't, but people can and do. Now we've got a bit of a challenge for you this morning, not just you, but with the congregation as well. We're going to sing 641, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. And the choir thought it's a great idea, I say that because they're getting the blame, the choir thought it was a great idea to sing it as a round. Okay? So that means the ladies start. You give this out while I'm explaining what's going to happen here. Okay? Let's get them all out. The ladies start and sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Allelu, alleluia. And at that point, the men all start. Right? And so as the ladies are singing the four alleluias, the men should be singing the verse. And what this means is if we all finish together, you've got it completely wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> we should not finish together. Right? So the ladies are going to sing right through to the alleluia, alleluia and then as they're singing the alleluias, the men start. See, so just listen to the men and ladies in the choir, and I'm sure you'll get it right. Okay, 641. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
a blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go knowing your peace, your love, and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of God, first as we find it in the New Testament in Acts, chapter 9, reading verses 1 through 18. And this can be found in the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles on page 127. Acts, chapter 9, reading from verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. Today's gospel is the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, and at verse 19, page 6 in your New Testaments. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, where Jesus taught, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, 
where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. <clears throat> Hymn 601. Look upon us, blessed Lord, take our wandering thoughts and guide us. Hymn 601. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There may be times when you're listening to the lecture readings on a Sunday morning when you find it doesn't really speak to you. It doesn't, it's not something to which you can immediately relate, no idea particularly comes to you about the, the immediate relevance of, of this message. There may be times when reading the lectionary readings for a Sunday morning, that happens to me, and that's actually more worrying. <laughs> and and I have, that's slightly, slightly the case uh, for this Sunday morning. The story of Paul is well known. It's of, very often referred to as the conversion of Paul. And we'll look at his earlier life and the situation he found himself in at the time of this event, but it's very often referred to as the conversion of Paul as he traveled on the road to Damascus. Paul himself refers to it slightly differently. He doesn't refer to it as his conversion. In his letters, he refers to his call from God. And in doing that, there's a real sense in which he identifies with the prophets of the Old Testament with Isaiah and Jeremiah, with Hosea and, and Amos and, and others who experienced this, this call uh, from, from God. And they say Paul seems to identify himself with that more than with the, the notion of, of conversion. In the 
New Testament, repentance, which is something which Paul may have undergone, but repentance means a change of mind. In the Old Testament, it means something slightly different. It means simply a turning around. Now, you may say there's a similarity, but there's a slight difference there as well. Not just a, a change of mind, but, but a turning around. And if Paul is identifying himself with some of the prophets of the Old Testament, then there's a real sense in which he identifies with others as well. One of the curious things about figures in the Old Testament um, is how flawed they were, and yet they become principal characters. Abraham, lying about the situation regarding his wife when he feels his own safety threatened. Uh, David, with some of his lecherous behavior and some of his abominable behavior in getting rid of someone by sending him to, to the front. Uh, Moses, with his temper and killing a man. Uh, Jacob, conniving, cheating. Uh, these were all figures that God, it seems, seeks to use uh, to, further his, to further his work. They're far from perfect. And indeed, Paul perhaps falls into, into that mold as well. One of the interesting things about Paul is that scholars try and flesh him out as a, as a human being in history. They find it quite difficult because of the lack of information we actually have about him. And it's intriguing that different scholars come up with pictures of him which are really quite, quite diverse, really quite, quite different. They have the usual sources. They use the Acts of the Apostles, from which we read today, and which were written by the same writer as the Gospel of Luke. But they use Paul's letters as well, which were written earlier than the Acts of the Apostles. And of course, they also use some of the other sources that are non-biblical. And by and large, what they tend to do when they're comparing what's written in the Acts of the Apostles with what Paul writes in his letters, they give priority to what Paul himself is saying and writing, recognizing that, that Luke, in writing the Acts of the Apostles, very often has his own particular agenda and wants to present Paul and the Pharisees in a particular way, whereas Paul himself in his letters presents at times a, a very different picture. Indeed, some scholars can't even agree where Paul was born and brought up. The general, the majority opinion is that he was brought up in Tarsus, uh, so he would be part of the sort of the Greek-speaking Roman world. And he'd be influenced by its thinking and its philosophy and the different philosophers, the Stoics and so on at that time. So they would have a, a clear bearing on, on his thinking. And yet, in Luke's Acts of the Apostles, we find Luke saying that he's brought up in Jerusalem um, and, in fact, had learned from the great Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. Scholars would pretty much be consistent in saying that, in fact, no, he was brought up in, in Tarsus. It's quite clear that his first language is Greek. He writes Greek well. He writes with a Greek idiom. Everything about him shows that a, a Greek learning and, and upbringing. And so he may have come to Jerusalem at a later date, but highly unlikely that he was, that he was brought up there. Is it agreed that he was a Pharisee? Well, No. I mean, the Pharisees in the main were to be found in Judea and in Jerusalem, not in the Gentile world, not in what was called the, the diaspora, where Jews had, had moved to. But he may have well been influenced by Phariseeism. The Pharisee movement really began in the time of the Hasmonean kings, when they elected as chief priest someone who should not have been elected to that post, someone not really fit for the position and not someone who was part of the, of, of the lineage. And so they took themselves off, some to Qumran in the desert, some to live out their religious lives, their lives of holiness uh, in their own homes and concentrating, and concentrating there. So that's Paul, that's his, his upbringing, a Greek upbringing. Paul always kind of found himself on the edge of things, You're kind of marginalized. He's brought up in a Greek culture. He's influenced by Greek thinking and teaching. But he's Jewish. And so that marginalizes him. When he becomes part of the, of the, 
of the Christian movement, the way as it was called, he finds himself marginalized from the, those that controlled it, the, the 12 apostles in, in Jerusalem. So he finds himself separated off, off from them. And as he continues his ministry in a Gentile, non-Jewish world, there's a sense in which he's marginalized from them as well. Uh, and again, that he's is, is Jewish now operating in a Gentile um, sort of context. So there's a lot about Paul that kind of puts him on the, on the margins at, at all times. And yet, again, when you look at his upbringing, his early days, he was someone who, as a Pharisee or influenced by the Pharisees' teaching, someone who would be committed to their laws of, of holiness. And that encompassed all of life. So why then do we find him, this man full of a kind of vitriol and hatred, persecuting the early church, the people of the way? It said he pursued them with a murderous intent. And we are told that when the first Christian martyr was stoned, Stephen, Paul was there uh, in, in the crowd and, and certainly did nothing to prevent it happening and may have been sympathetic to what was being done. But in his pursuing of other Christians, he would certainly have them arrested, bound, taken to Jerusalem, brought before the council, and imprisoned. But executed, no. Because as we know, the Jewish authorities, the Jewish councils, didn't have the authority to execute. And that's why, of course, ultimately, Jesus was handed over to the, to the Roman state. So, not someone, when he said a murderous attempt, it's a sort of... Uh, exaggeration if you like. He certainly wasn't responsible for, for any executions. But imprisonment, imprisonment, yes. What drives that? What made him like that? And one can, one can speculate. It suggested there may have been a political element in it, that he was fearful that this new movement, this new messianic movement, would incur the wrath of the Roman Empire. And so he sees it safer to have it put down. So there may have well been a political involvement in it. And there may well have been a religious one too in terms of his commitment to, to Phariseeism and there was aspects of this new way which he very much took issue. But to pursue, to chase, to imprison. And so in this account we find him on the road to Damascus having been given the authority by the chief priest in Jerusalem to go and find those who are following the new way and arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and in all likelihood for imprisonment. And something happens to them on the way. Now it's described very graphically. A great blinding light. And then a voice from, from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me so? And we're told that those with him hear the voice but see nothing. And then the follow up when Saul says, who, who is this speaking? It is Jesus, he said, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he remains blind for, for three days. And there may be a symbolism in that, like the, the three days in the, in the tomb, as it were. And at the end of it, we're told he spends the three days fasting, neither eating nor drinking, but constantly in prayer. But at the end of the three days, it seems he is a changed man. How does that come about? Why does that come about? What changes people in, in such a way, and in such a time? What was the experience? And, and some here today may have had a similar experience of a sudden change in their life, a, a reversal of direction, something quite dramatic. It's likely that the majority have not. That they have grown into the Christian faith quietly, steadily, through parents and grandparents and, and involvement in the church. And the sort of experience that Paul had is quite alien to them. But certainly change he had, and he did. And if you find yourself unable to relate to Paul on this particular experience, if that part of the story doesn't speak to you, then see if Ananias does. Because Ananias has it seems has a sort of vision. He's told by God that he should go to Saul. And as I said to the children, Ananias says, I, th I think you've got the wrong man here. This is, this is the man who's persecuting us, who's causing all sorts of mayhem to the, to the early church. And God says, 
He is to be my chosen instrument for a mission to the, to the Gentiles. It's interesting, a, a better translation than instrument is earthen vessel. An earthen vessel. And Paul uses that term, an earthen vessel. It suggests something that is flawed, uh, not something that's perfect, something kind of ordinary. One translator put it, a cracked pot. He didn't put cracked pot, it was cracked pot. <laughs> so Paul was described as a cracked pot that God was to use as his, as his instrument. And so Ananias does go to him, probably fearful, probably less than convinced. Ananias comes a bit like, across a bit like Jonah, doesn't he? When Jonah's told to go to Nineveh, to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, God's salvation. He says, I'm not going there. These are our enemies. And he takes off in a boat in the wrong direction. Well, Ananias is not quite so rebellious. He goes, but he goes reluctantly. And he finds Saul, and his sight is restored, and he baptizes him. Paul's history, of course, in part, we know. The scholars try and flesh it out, but some of it we know. He became a great missionary to the Gentiles, to the non Jewish world. We can read of his missionary journeys, his missionary adventures, of his conflict with the early church in Rome and the, and the disciples there. We have his letters to read. Of Ananias, we hear nothing. And yet, it's through Ananias and his visit to Saul and his baptizing him and his healing him that the church ultimately, through Paul, spreads throughout the Mediterranean. As I say, we may find it difficult to identify with Paul's experience, but Ananias, how often have we perhaps used the phrase, a leopard never changes its spots. Ananias didn't know that Saul had changed when he was sent to him. All he knew was that he had been told to go to him, and he did that, but he didn't know that Saul had changed. And it was only subsequently he finds that Saul had changed. And we find that he was then instructed in this new way, the, 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 Christian, the Christian faith. Ananias, despite his fears and his doubts, took the risk on someone of whom he had great doubts. Sometimes we perhaps have to do the same. Those that we think are are not fit, those of whom we are suspicious, those of whom we don't have a great deal of confidence, those who might have changed without ever knowing it, those with whom we have a broken relationship, and broken perhaps for good reasons, and think that that will never change either. Sometimes, sometimes, like Ananias, in faith we simply have to take the risk. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In 484, great God, your love has called us here. In 484.
Wednesday evening saw the, the death of Christ Church's senior elder, Jimmy Kemp. Jimmy passed away on, on, Wednesday, on Wednesday evening. It's always sad when we lose loved ones. But there's a sense, too, of great thanksgiving for a long life and a full life for Jimmy's place here in Bermuda and in, in Christchurch. And in truth, for some time now, Jimmy has been ready, ready to go. Fairly recently, he was given a DNA testing kit to establish who his ancestors were. And Jimmy's response, I'm not so much interested where I've come from, I'm more interested where I'm going. <laughs> I think we can all rest assured that Jimmy lies safe in God's peaceful keeping. But we'll miss him. And in our prayers today, we'll give thanks for all those whom we have lost. And remember, especially in our prayers to Jimmy's family. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and your blessings to us in life, we give you thanks. For your constant love, which sustains us. In times of joy and happiness and celebration, but in times too of struggle, sorrow and loss. We give thanks for your love for all creation. The life of creation itself, the life of this planet and the diversity of human life. With all our differences, yet created in your image. We give thanks too for the life of Christ. For his example of selfless service. And thank you too for the life of the prophets and of the saints, of Paul, of Ananias, of the part they played in the establishment of your church, and for the opportunities that we too have, the opportunities to change, to leave behind that which we no longer value, to leave behind the disappointments and the regrets, the gift always of new life. And in Christ's name now, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for those whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time. We pray for our families and our friends, wherever they may be, and ask for your blessing upon them, that they may know your peace and know the way to truth and to life. We pray for those whom we know to be in need through illness or loneliness, those recovering from illness, those receiving treatment still, those whose illness knows no cure. We pray for those who are anxious, any who are troubled, those for whom life at this time is simply a struggle. May they feel surrounded by your love and may we seek to offer them our support. We pray too for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have been bereaved, whether in recent days, months or years, but live with that sense of absence. May they be touched by the healing of your Holy Spirit. And we pray for those whose names we do not know, but who are known and loved by you. Those whose lives are very similar to our own and those whose lives are very different those who live in relative peace and well-being, those caught up in the midst of conflict and war, which so stars, scars the beauty of this, your world. We remember in our prayers those who are driven by hatred and enmity, who cannot get beyond bitter legacies of the past, who cannot begin to overcome the barriers that presently divide, and who inflict on others, men, women, and children, unspeakable cruelty. We pray for a day of greater peace for those who presently toil in the midst of such violence. And we remember those who are the victims of poverty and hunger in a world of plenty, where some have far more than they need, where others go without the basic necessities of life. May we all commit ourselves to working for a better sharing of our world's resources. We remember too in our prayers those who govern us. May they be men and women 
of honesty and integrity. May they be driven by an ambition to follow the values and the priorities of your kingdom and the greater sense of justice and care for the most vulnerable. And we pray too for your church, for the life of this congregation, for your church here on the island and your church in the world, made up of earthen vessels, like Paul, like Ananias, like ourselves, with our faults and failings and limitations. May we be guided in the ways of greater love, compassion, and truth, that we might better reveal your love for us and for all peoples. And we remember too always those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. May we never think them far away. They rest now safe with you. And we share a fellowship and communion with them still through that fellowship and communion that we have with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name, we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In 513, courage, brother, do not stumble, though your path be dark as night. In 513.
Now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always.